everybody. Um, uh, I'm Joydeep, um, co-founder and CTO at Cubal. And uh, uh, I'm here um, um, to talk about uh, transactions and data lakes. So um, let's get going. To begin with, uh, I would like to uh, start with a bit of a background on this topic. Um, how is data stored in the data lake? Why we need transactions? And some of the historical work in this area. So um, we're looking at a picture which shows um, the traditional uh, you know, layout of the data lake. Uh, this picture shows us a couple of tables, a page view table and a clicks table. And it shows uh, some data stored in the cloud storage system um, for these tables. Um, and the data, as many people are familiar with, is stored under partitions. Uh, in these both these cases, we can see um, partition named after the date uh, field. Engines like Spark, Hive, Presto, um, and others um, <clears throat> interact with the Hive Metastore uh, to get table metadata. So um, uh, in this particular picture, we can see Apache Spark is uh, asks Hive Metastore about the location of the page view data, um, is told that the page view data lives under a certain path, and you know then can start processing that data. Now, why do we need transactions, uh, and what is the historical uh, work that has been done in this area? So as a background, um, to the extent that Hive is the sort of the de facto, uh, you know, data lake sort of uh, uh, engine and metastore, I've always supported um, atomic appends uh, and overrides to a partition. Um, in the good old days of uh, uh, the on-premise and Hadoop and HDFS, um, and in order to uh, allow concurrent reads and writes, it also added uh, locks on partitions so that uh, readers and writers don't uh, clobber each other. However, as the, uh, uh, the big data space, uh, the data lake space, and the usage of the cloud has expanded massively, many uh, problems started showing up in this uh, minimalistic framework. Uh, object stores uh, did not provide atomic rename operations like SDFS. And so uh, just the basics of doing atomic writes and appends uh, became problematic um, in the world of uh, cloud computing. Um, while uh, the locks that Hive had added way back in like 2013 were useful, but they were also infeasible. Um, uh, in this ecosystem, there are many long running queries and you also have patterns where there are um, uh, small writes uh, while data is being ingested, while you know larger queries may be running, and it is not really possible in all cases to have um, blocking locks that um, uh, you know uh, prevent readers and writers from running together. Um, uh, the object stores also had another issue, uh, which is um, that they were often eventually consistent, and so um, that created um, correctness problems where the query engine may not be able to see all the data all the time, um, and that would obviously lead to um, incorrect results and so on. Uh, very importantly, architecturally, um, uh, completely unrelated to all these cloud-related uh, aspects, there was really no support for row-level updates and deletes uh, in the uh, in original work that was done in Hive and Hadoop uh, uh, sort of ecosystem. And these, this requirement became very important as we... Uh, entered a world of GDPR and CCPA regulations uh, with stringent requirements around uh, retention uh, and deletion of uh, user data. It became very important uh, for the data lake to support uh, deletion of records. Finally, um, Hive also did not have uh, update and merge uh, statements uh, in its uh, SQL query language. Um, and and th th this wasn't just a blocker for regulations, but also as a blocker from an ecosystem point of view, because most of the CDC tools like, um, um, uh, you know, the, the Informatica's and um, uh, Golden Gates and um, uh, all this uh, uh, sort of famous CDC software that people use to get data from one database to another uh, really required um, uh, support for upserts and merge statements uh, in SQL. Uh, and, and so as the data lake market expanded and uh, uh, more and more people tried to use it, they found that some of the familiar tooling uh, and the ingestion patterns that they were used to would no longer work uh, in this new ecosystem. So with this background, um, let's look at, uh, you know, what are the things that um, need to be done to fix this ecosystem? 
so there was a general realization that uh, tables and partitions need to be multi-version, that just locking will not do. And this goes back to the point I made in the previous slide about um, uh, readers and writers holding each other up for a long time uh, is problematic. Uh, and with multi-version um, uh, concurrency control and multiple versions of the data, uh, readers and writers can work on different versions of the data while not blocking each other. Um, that also allows maintenance operations, uh, and we'll, we'll talk a lot about that uh, in the coming slides, uh, to progress in parallel with the, the operations of the query engines themselves. Um, uh, we need to resolve conflicts during concurrent updates. Um, we need, as we uh, discussed, the ability to update and delete individual rows, uh, but also you know, potentially large number of rows, and to do that efficiently. Uh, we need to provide maintenance operations like compactions. Um, again, just to provide some historical um, insight here, uh, small files in Hadoop, um, and also nowadays in the cloud object storage systems, is a problem that you know probably hundreds of thousands of data engineers have dealt with. And um, it has become very critical to handle those problems by automatically uh, compacting data. Uh, and so any sort of uh, you know, new strategy to uh, organize data in the data lake uh, should absolutely you know, provide for uh, those kind of fundamental primitives. Uh, and finally, you know, the importance of the CDC ecosystem and the surrounding ecosystem tooling uh, requires um, the go-forward strategy to have good ODBC, JDBC drivers with SQL DML statement supports like merge statements, update, and delete statements. Um, in the last few years, uh, a number of uh, solutions have uh, emerged in the open source and um, sort of semi-open source, I would say, uh, ecosystem um, uh, based on this sort of new evolving patterns uh, that we just discussed. Uh, I've listed four projects here, which are the predominant sort of players in providing a new generation of transactional uh, data sort of manipulation and ingest in the cloud. Uh, namely Apache Hoodie, which came from uh, Uber, um, Delta Lake, uh, 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 and I'm specifically referring here to the open source version of Delta Lake that came from Databricks, um, the Hive Asset Framework, which is part of the overall Apache Hive project, uh, which has come out of Ortonworks and uh, Cloudera, and uh, finally Apache Iceberg, which is uh, um, um, probably the, um, uh, the newest of the lot, uh, came from uh, Netflix. Each of these uh, uh, systems has, um, uh, you know, gotten traction and adoption uh, in a uh, certain uh, subset of the ecosystem. And so we'll, we'll just dive a little bit deeper and see, you know, what is the what are the differences between these uh, projects? The general goal of all of these projects was um, pretty similar, um, um, as we discussed. However, they made different choices in their architecture in how they tried to solve these problems. So let's look at some of the most fundamental uh, properties um, uh, which differentiate between these uh, frameworks. Number one, how do we store um, multiple versions of data? Um, uh, and, and how do we store the metadata associated with these versions? And also potentially, how do we store the files that uh, comprise these versions and the tables and the partitions? Um, Apache, Hoodie, Iceberg, and Delta all took a strategy of creating a self-contained system where the object storage itself was responsible for holding all of this metadata. Uh, for many users, uh, they can think of this almost like a Git repository kind of uh, approach where data and metadata are sort of included together and there is no centralized server um, that uh, hosts the metadata. Uh, Hive took a very different approach where metadata is centralized in the Hive Metastore. Uh, and also in, in DynamoDB to handle uh, eventual consistency. Secondly, um, how do we resolve conflicts and what do we do about multiple readers and writers uh, sort of all, all working together, uh, particularly multiple writers? Um, so again, Hudi, Iceberg, and Delta, um, because of the lack uh, of a centralized monitor, and I would say this is more of a um, necessity than a virtue, um, took an approach of optimistic concurrency control, which is that they, they did not detect conflicts uh, up front, they did not take locks up front, and did uh, any conflict resolution um, at commit time. Uh, whereas Hive Asset, because you know it had this nice centralized um, uh, server in the Hive Metastore, was able to use a different um, um, approach, which is typically called pessimistic locking, where 
uh, readers and writers would, uh, you know, get certain forms of locks on tables and partitions um, uh, uh, as they are working on them. And so this would lead to um, more upfront detection of any conflicts. Finally, um, while all these frameworks um, support data ingest by writing new files, uh, however, the way they handle modifications of uh, existing files, uh, uh, existing data is very different. Um, Delta in particular um, took an approach of modifying existing files if a row within those files was modified. Um, so the entire file would be rewritten. Uh, and, and that's sort of a workable strategy if the file sizes are small. Whereas Hive Asset took a very different approach, uh, which is to say that um, no matter the number of rows that are getting modified, uh, we would record those modified rows or deleted rows in a separate uh, file and not modify the original file. Uh, Hoodie supports both the modes, uh, and um, Iceberg is uh, still a work in progress uh, from my understanding uh, in terms of how they uh, are going to handle uh, row modification, and they might end up supporting both the modes as well. Uh, the last uh, point I would also um, uh, mention is because Hive Asset has a centralized database and a monitor uh, sort of an architecture, there are also things which are missing in other uh, systems like a, a transaction queue and a transaction log. And uh, as we will sort of go forward and discuss, you know, that, that makes certain things uh, uh, far easier to understand and manage. So at this point, let me... Uh, switch gears and talk a little bit about what we as a company, Cubol, has done in the space. Um, and we're starting to call it Cubol Asset. Uh, um, Cubol Asset yeah, builds on Hive Asset. So uh, it is it is built on a foundation of open source. And, and in fact, all the software is open source. Uh, but it extends that open source in many different ways. Uh, so for example, um, we have extended read support to Apache Spark and Presto to be able to read files that are generated by the Hive Asset framework. So remember, Hive Asset came from Apache Hive, was um, sort of had single engine origins where Hive was both producing and consuming the data, but it's all open source, open format. So we were able to extend support uh, for this format in other open source engines like Apache Spark and Presto. Uh, we also made significant enhancements to Apache Spark to not just be able to read this data, but to be able to uh, modify um, and update Hive Asset tables from Apache Spark. Um, so we've added update, delete, and merge support to Apache Spark. Again, this is also open source. And this is very important because Spark is also um, uh, equally, uh, if not more, used as an ETL platform for data manipulation as Hive is. Uh, whereas Presto is, you know, is typically sort of more of a read-only uh, environment. The Cubol Hive Asset Framework uh, also supports um, ODBC and JDBC drivers out of the box. Um, and um, alongside those drivers provide SQL DML statements, update, delete, and merge statements, um, uh, which can be used by CDC tools. And uh, you know, we've been working with uh, enterprise CDC tool vendors like Strim to provide an end-to-end -end, um, data ingest um, experience for enterprise users. Cubol Asset, again, leverages Hive Asset to build offer both automatic and manual compactions. Um, we believe this is a very important part of the overall user experience. And uh, in the Cubal Asset Framework, one can set up a maintenance cluster um, to offload all compaction workloads. So primary sort of uh, you know uh, compute clusters do their regular sort of VTL processing or query processing, whereas all um, background deletion, compaction, and other kinds of data maintenance activities can be offloaded to a separate set of machines, uh, thereby not impacting the primary um, uh, processing cluster. Uh, this also gives administrators um, a lot of insight into uh, how much they're spending on uh, compaction and data maintenance, while also giving them a centralized place to set compaction policies. And finally, you know, all of this is open source, uh, so uh, uh, this includes many uh, fixes and contributions to Apache Hive and also Apache Spark, Presto, and uh, so on. So just to re-summarize, um, uh, in a more pictorial, uh, nicer looking slide, you know, we, Cubol Asset supports full transactions. Uh, it supports um, uh, data security and privacy and uh, governance um, for GDPR and CCPA requirements. Um, uh, it allows readers and fast writes and uh, uh, interactive queries while tables are being uh, updated and modified. Um, uh, it has strong data consistency, integrity, and availability guarantees. 
and um, it, it's completely open source. Uh, uh, and uh, in, in fact, even cloud agnostic, you know, the same framework can work equally well uh, on premises, hybrid, or in the cloud. Well, uh, you know, we've already alluded to some of the differences in the architecture and uh, some of the advantages that Hive Asset has. So um, th these were our reasons for um, building um, uh, our uh, asset and transactions framework solution around Hive Asset. So number one, you know, Hive Asset has a very comprehensive transactional framework. It is not a single table framework. Uh, there is a global um, notion of transactions uh, across all the tables. Um, and it is possible to build on this framework to build stronger serializability properties. So right now, while most of these frameworks support what is called snapshot isolation, uh, with Hive being a little bit stronger because of uh, pessimistic locking, uh, but it is possible to build on the foundation uh, provided by the Hive Asset uh, transactional framework to uh, build things like uh, transactional blocks uh, and uh, you know more stronger isolation levels over time. Uh, we felt that the merge on read architectural decision taken by Hive Asset had certain advantages. Um, it, in particular, leads to lesser write amplification. Um, so, in particular, if data sets are very, very large and updates to those data sets are random and scattered over a very large amount of data, uh, that can become quite problematic with a copy on write approach. And we have seen these patterns in large companies with. Uh, yeah, you know, very large data sets um, uh, and having to sort of, you know, go through all of that and read out, you know, records, for example, of a single user or a single uh, advertising campaign and so on. And so in these cases, you know, the, the merge on read um, uh, functionality and the lower write amplification becomes a very important advantage. Uh, Hive, of course, um, the nice thing is uh, has always been very SQL-centric and has had nice drivers. Um, and uh, you know supported the both the, the SQL DML statements as well as you know ODBC JDBC drivers out of the box. There was also a mature existing ecosystem with an installed user base. So some of the enterprise CDC tools uh, already have a history of working with Hive to ingest data. One of the unique things about Hive in uh, you know across all these frameworks was how nicely it supported automatic compactions. And I would like to point out that it is not just the support of automatic compactions, but the fact that it's really a decoupled architecture where um, in the Hive Metastore, there is a sort of a queue, um, so to say, of transactions um, which are centrally monitored and compactions are driven off that. Whereas in other frameworks, compactions are really tightly coupled to the job that is uh, ingesting data, typically. Um, and so this decoupled architecture leads to a lot of flexibility in terms of um, um, providing the entire sort of ecosystem as a service and managing it. Um, that is much harder with a you know with a coupled architecture. And finally, uh, Apache um, Hive Asset uh, has a very uh, mature Apache open open source governance model, proven for many many years, uh, which uh, you know we have worked with as well. And that's uh, we believe is a strong requirement in this market uh, for future proving our customers. So the next uh, half of this uh, uh, presentation, I'm going to get a little bit more technical and take a little bit of a deeper dive into uh, how Cubol Acid and Hive Acid works. Uh, the nice thing is that uh, while a lot of the, the content here is somewhat specific to Hive Acid, but many of these frameworks share a lot of common uh, traits. And so uh, what we're going to go through here is, in many cases, applies also conceptually to how other frameworks work. So in order, you know, we'll just look at um, how to use Hive Asset tables uh, from a user point of view. Um, what changes? How, how is data stored differently? Um, what are the, some of the basics of transactions and multi-versioning? Um, how that works and how that helps solve this concurrent reader and writer problem? How do compactions work? Uh, what, what changes uh, we uh, and the ecosystem has made as, uh, to, to Spark and Presto to be able to work with Hive Asset tables? Um, and finally, uh, you know, some notes on performance and what we are going to do next in this area. So jumping right in. So the first slide is uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, it, it goes through how users interact with Hive Asset Tables. So as you can see, I'll just go top down from the first bullet. It's actually pretty straightforward and very, very similar to how any other database works. You know, you create a table, uh, and the only special thing we have done in this table is really to declare it as a transactional table. Uh, that tells Hive that you know this table has to be stored in the Hive Asset format. Uh, once we create the table, you know, we can insert data into it, uh, again, in, in a very standard SQL uh, syntax, insert values X and values Y, 
And we can, of course, you know, do that many, many times. Uh, we can delete data from this table by specifying uh, a delete uh, predicate. So here we are saying delete from master table where key equals one. Um, we can update uh, the value. So um, after these operations, only key equals two is left. And we can go and say, hey, update asset table set value equals updated where key equals two. Um, we can also issue more complex merge statements uh, where uh, we need a combination of sort of um, insert, delete, and update policies. Uh, and we can write a uh, merge statement uh, to deal with incoming data and to take different actions based on the value of the incoming data. I won't go through all of it. It's a little bit complex. Uh, and finally, from the reader's point of view, you know, they can just continue to query this data um, uh, just the same, right? So you can just do a select star or, or just write an arbitrarily complex uh, select statement on the data while all of this is going on, which is the inserts, updates, deletes, merges. Uh, they can all be going on. So pretty straightforward from a user experience point of view. Now, how, how, does, the, how, how does the storage layout uh, change? Um, remember, uh, you know, when we started off this discussion, uh, uh, I showed you how tables are stored in the data lake um, uh, to begin with. You know, we have um, somewhat familiar notions of a directory for the table and then sort of subdirectories for the partitions underneath that table. And there can be you know, many levels of partitions within a table. Um, what Hive Asset does is it adds an extra level of directories under the leaf level partition. Um, and the reason it does that is to essentially store different versions of the data uh, and to store changes to those versions. So in this example, you can see that uh, our good old page views table, uh, which had uh, the uh, a date partition for uh, you know, June 1st, 2020, has now an extra subdirectory called base underscore H. Right? Um, now, what, 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 what do these uh, numbers and what does these prefixes mean? So the base uh, uh, prefix uh, represents a fully compacted uh, partition or table. Um, it is similar to how uh, tables and partitions were stored previously in Hive, which is all the data was in one directory. Uh, and so if you went underneath one of these directories called base underscore something, you would see uh, all the data as of a certain point in time uh, in that table or in that partition. On top of the base data, which can, by the way, also be empty, Hive stores two different kinds of updates, uh, delete rows. So if you deleted rows or if you updated them, it would first put out delete markers for certain rows on the base data. And those would go in a directory called delete data. And if you were inserting rows or updating rows, um, the, the modified rows would be inserted on top of the delete, deleted data. And those would go into directories called uh, prefixed with delta underscore. And so these are the three kinds of directories that you would see under um, um, uh, under a Hive table and partition in this new world of Hive Asset. Um, the numbers represent uh, transaction IDs. Um, so we, we will not go you know, too deep into them, but uh, for, from a very layman point of view, one could say that they sort of represent certain points in time. Uh, they allow uh, uh, the system to sort of, you know, uh, work on data as of a certain point in time. So with this uh, uh, in place, you know, let's look at an um, um, animation workflow of how um, readers and writers work together uh, on uh, a, a high asset table. So we'll start with a table, uh, which is just called table in this uh, particular um, uh, uh, slide. Uh, which has a partition called uh, p uh, equals one, and currently has two transactions on it, transactions one and two, and uh, has data corresponding to, uh, to both these transactions in a couple of delta directories. So in a nutshell, the, 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 the partition p equals one at this point is composed of data from two transactions stored in the two directories that you can see on this slide. A processing agent in this particular case, Apache Spark, uh, wants to read this data in this part, uh, in this partition. Comes to the Hive Metastore and says, "Hey, you know, uh, uh, can you tell me what data I am supposed to read?" And Hive Metastore um, queries its internal um, database and says, "Hey, you know, you, you have to read data from transactions one and two because that's the latest data as of this point in time." Um, Spark uh, would then go into the file system and look for certain directories. Uh, for these two transactions and start processing them. In the meantime, uh, we have another client, um, and in this example, coming from Apache Hive, 
which wants to insert new rows into this table while Apache Spark is running uh, on the data that is existing at this point in time. Hive comes to the meta store and says, hey, you know, um, I, I want to write some new data. So let's open a new transaction. Hive uh, allocates a new transaction uh, three, and Hive starts writing data to the Delta directories for transaction number three. So you can see that you know at some point Hive has written out a new directory uh, called Delta underscore three, and uh, it tells the meta store that hey you know I'm, I'm done. So transaction three is now committed, right? So the, the now in this in this particular partition there are three committed transactions one two and three, and there are no running transactions. Uh, a third client uh, in this example again from Presto comes in and says hey I want to read um, uh, partition P equals one. Um, again, goes through the same cycle, um, asks the Metastore to give it uh, a set of valid transactions to read. And now the Metastore returns it back uh, three transactions, one, two, and three, that Presto will read. So notice again that while we have Spark still running uh, on the partition with uh, against just the um, transactions one and two, because that was the data that existed at the point of time that Spark started working on the data. Um, Presto um, is uh, going to process data uh, for transactions one, two, and three. Um, <clears throat> and, and so, you know, it would talk to the cloud storage system uh, in the same way that Spark did, uh, pull data for these three transactions. And then at some point, of course, you know, both of these um, query engines would get done. So what we showed in this example is how the <clears throat> um, storing um, different transactions in different folders and having the metadata for them in the Hive meta store allows concurrent readers and writers and allows uh, readers to um, get a snapshot view of the data where they get a point in time view of the data and are able to work on it. Uh, and for readers to be able to get newer data as it arrives over time. Let's look at compactions, which is uh, another uh, you know, very interesting aspect of this architecture. And as we discussed, you know, one of the ways um, Hive Asset differs substantially from other systems. So we'll start off again with a bit of a, um, uh, you know, uh, some, some architectural building blocks. Uh, we have a Hive cluster in this picture on the left side. Um, we have the object storage system, and of course we have the Hive Minister. We have highlighted one of the components of the Hive cluster, which we call the HMS, the Hive Metastore server, and it has a very important role to play. Um, uh, this could be any of the any Hive cluster, but uh, uh, in this example, this particular Hive cluster is taking care of uh, compactions. So imagine over time that you know there are a number of transactions that are happening uh, against tables, um, similar to the picture that we saw in the previous slide. Um, so those are represented on your far left with a bunch of insert, delete, uh, and other statements, um, resulting, of course, in a bunch of directories showing up uh, inside uh, the storage system. You know, lots and lots of, uh, well, not lots and lots, but quite a few uh, of these Delta directories. Of course, this is potentially asking for trouble because we now have data scattered in many, many directories in potentially small files. And as everybody who has dealt with uh, data processing in this ecosystem, you know that can uh, lead to significantly slowed down uh, data processing. So the HMS initiator um, is continuously watching these tables. Uh, in this particular example, um, it is watching table one. And at a certain point, it says, hey, you know, there are too many delta directories in this table. Um, performance is likely to get impacted, so I better do something about it. And what it does is it creates a, an entry in what is called a compaction queue, uh, noting that table one needs to undergo uh, a compaction. And, and uh, I'll explain this later. That this, is, this compaction is called a minor compaction. Um, in the meantime, a user can also come in through uh, a command line or a Hive client or um, a similar uh, sort of tool and issue an alter table statement uh, which can trigger what is called a major compaction. So alter table, partition, compact, major. And that will also create an entry in the compaction queue. So what we have described here is that compaction can be driven both by on automatic mechanisms where the HMS uh, and the initiator component within HMS is monitoring data sets 
uh, and watching for certain thresholds, which are configurable by the user and the administrator. And they can also be triggered manually by the user by issuing an a alter table command from the command line. Once these entries are populated in the compaction queue, workers in HMS, um, those workers could be in the same cluster that we saw previously, or in this example, they could be workers in a different cluster, pick up entries from these queues and start working on them. So in this particular case, the HMS worker in a secondary cluster will notice that there is a compaction job for uh, partition one and table one, and will go through all the subdirectories um, in partition one. And as you notice, it has produced a new Delta directory. Uh, and if you notice the numbering, um, you can sort of guess what's going on. This new Delta directory has compacted data from all the existing Delta directories. So we started with Delta 1 to Delta 11 and produced a new Delta directory called Delta 1 underscore 11, which uh, read and compacted all the data from uh, transactions 1 through 11 and produced uh, a new uh, copy of it um, uh, all compacted into one directory. And this is called a minor compaction, where we are just uh, compacting um, um, uh, the deltas that have been applied to a base table. It, it would then go ahead and uh, you know mark um, uh, this uh, particular compaction uh, task as being done um, and, and would create a cleanup uh, job for this same job. So it'll say, hey, you know, now that I've compacted all this data, all these old delta directories are sort of, um, uh, you know, they're, they're not really um, useful anymore. So I can, somebody can go ahead and clean them up. Uh, again, you know, this is also where uh, the centralized um, transaction log and repository of Hive is very useful uh, uh, because Hive knows, uh, the Hive Metastore knows every uh, processing um, qu query that is running in the system and knows, you know, uh, what transactions uh, they are reading and what, what tables they are reading and so on. It is, it is able to manage the cleanup job and clean up uh, directories only when they are not in use. Uh, and this is very hard to do in a, uh, a system you know, which does not really have um, a centralized way to track all readers. Um, uh, there, one can only do sort of time-based cleanup, uh, but uh, here, more uh, interesting approaches are possible. In any case, at some point, uh, the cleaner job comes along, notices this entry in the compaction queue saying that you know, uh, some data can be cleaned up. Uh, and uh, goes ahead and removes all the data that we had previously compacted. So this gives you an end-to-end -end overview of how data comes in, gets written out into a bunch of directories, um, um, and compactions are automatically triggered by either manual uh, SQL statements or by automatic sort of data monitoring. Um, data is compacted, and then, if possible, uh, based on policies and based on um, the presence of other uh, readers in the system, uh, old data can be cleaned up. Um, let me not go too deep into the other one, which is the major compaction, but uh, the idea of a major compaction is that it does not just collapse all the delta directories, but produces a new base version of the data. So it will take the base version of the data, all the deltas that were applied on top of it, um, you collapse them all together, compact them up, and produce a new ba base uh, uh, version of the table. It's more expensive, that's why it's called major, uh, because it has to rewrite all the data and not just the deltas that were applied to the base data. Moving on, uh, so Kubol, uh, with the community, uh, with with uh, you know our um, uh, the extended ecosystem in uh, companies like Cloudera, has made uh, uh, enhancements to um, uh, Spark and Presto. Um, uh, also, uh, uh, you know, collaborated heavily with uh, uh, the Presto SQL community um, uh, uh, from Facebook, Starburst, and so on. Um, so Presto SQL three three one and onwards supports Hive tables. Um, uh, users, uh, uh, those who are interested, can go to the Presto SQL um, uh, blog uh, post that discusses this in great amount of detail as to what was implemented and how it was implemented. Um, similarly, we have published a Hive Asset data source in Spark. Um, uh, this is not inside the core Spark, but it, it's an open source uh, data source that can be plugged into any Spark deployment. Um, and we've also written a nice blog post uh, describing how it works and how users can use it in their Spark um, uh, you know, setup to work against high passive tables. On the Spark side, we have added uh, DML statement supports, so inserts, updates, deletes, and merges, which uh, do not exist in open source Spark by default, but those are also part of the data source uh, uh, that we have submitted. Uh, and in addition to the data source, we have also submitted support for these um, enhanced sort of SQL statements. Um, so, so users can 
you know, do a bunch of stuff programmatically against high passive tables, but they can also use merge statements, which are just so much easier to use. Finally, I'll be conclude this uh, discussion with a little bit of insight into where we are going with Kibol Asset. Um, so we, 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 in some ways, you know, we are just getting started. Um, we, we just sort of taken the first baby steps to uh, support what are, uh, frankly, very uh, baseline uh, expectations uh, uh, in the traditional database uh, world, which is sort of concurrent readers and writers, um, uh, you know, ability to uh, deal with conflicts, uh, multi-version concurrency control, and, and uh, so on, right? Automated um, uh, compactions, vacuuming, and other sort of databases, and so on. Uh, however, this base, this, this foundation really allows us to do st really interesting stuff. So we have already been working on indexes for a while, and uh, uh, one of the things that you know will will be coming out very soon is the ability to have indexes on data sets. It is really important to have uh, the asset framework when it comes to supporting indexes. So because first of all, you know, indexes can be global and so indexes can be, can see very high update rates uh, and in a certain, in, in potentially a random manner, even where uh, the modifications to the base table and partitions are highly localized. Um, uh, so uh, the only way to really build effective indexes and to allow uh, them to be updated frequently is to have multiple uh, some multi-versioning facility on the index tables themselves. And uh, the asset frameworks are, gives us a foundation where we can start building index tables, which are themselves multi-versioned, and readers can take advantage of the index tables for speeding up queries while writers are modifying or appending data and thereby you know, modifying these indexes. Uh, materialized views have very similar considerations, uh, and those would, uh, you know, sort of follow once uh, indexes are in place. Currently, Hive Asset only supports the ORC framework. Uh, we are in the middle of um, uh, developing support for Parquet files. Uh, you know, many users in this ecosystem uh, have uh, traditionally used Parquet files and would like to use them, uh, even with uh, support for transactions. And so that is something we are working on. Uh, but I would also note that. Uh, for streaming data ingest or for insert-only tables, any uh, any file format uh, is, is supported at this point. You know, both Parquet um, and, and ORC are good for that. Uh, one of the advantages of uh, uh, some of the other systems like Delta and Woody is that they have all offered very nice functionality around time travel, where users can not only uh, you know read write data at the same time atomically and so on, but because there are multiple versions of data available, they allow users to go back and forth in time and be able to look at uh, sort of older versions of data. And this can, uh, in particular, be very, very useful in uh, debugging scenarios. You know, So for example, if you made a change and you either want to unwind the change or you want to go back and look at the old version of the data and see what has changed, uh, these kind of facilities can be very, very useful. Um, so um, uh, uh, Hive of course, also has uh, older versions of data available. It just doesn't provide a first-class user interface to be able to access those versions, and that is something that we hope to provide in the future. Finally, uh, you know, one of the very important drivers of this whole project was integration with CDC tools and to be able to allow um, people in the um, enterprise ecosystem um, access the ability to ingest data and load data into data lakes through uh, the, their favorite enterprise CDC tools. Um, and so we have been working with Stream, uh, for example, as one of the one uh, enterprise vendors in the CDC space, and uh, we already have a working solution available uh, with them. And we hope to bring more of these uh, enterprise-grade CDC capabilities to the market, um, um, uh, you know, along with these partners. Uh, with that, let me uh, come to the conclusion of this uh, talk. Um, so this is me. Uh, I am uh, Jason Sarma on Twitter, and also, of course, uh, you can reach me at my Qbol email address, jsarma at qbol.com. Um, and uh, I will pause here, and I am uh, uh, I would love to take some questions. Um, um, so please go ahead and uh, 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 send us your questions, uh, and I will uh, we'll try to take them as soon as possible. Thank you so much.